Welcome to Main Island, located on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Sartlip First Nation between Vancouver and Victoria, BC. You can find shell middens here, where mussel, clam, oyster, and whelk shells have been deposited by early hunter-gatherers. We're going to explore the intertidal zone at various beaches on Maine. You'll note here a sign of vertical zonation, which we'll see more of later in this video. But first, it turns out I wasn't the only curious animal snooping around during low tide. There's a seal here, some gulls, and of course, Canada geese. Here they are with some goslings. I tend to focus on two things, sleeping and feeding. This is a mink, a carnivorous mammal with webbed feet and oily fur to keep their coat waterproof. Here's a raccoon wading in search of an easy meal. When the tide is low, intertidal organisms are more exposed to terrestrial predators. This crow has caught something wriggly. And the great blue heron, to some Coast Salish peoples representing self-determination, patience, and grace. Herons are believed to have innate wisdom and co-create their journey through balance and determination. Watch her snatch a fish right out of the water. Now, before we look at some seaweeds and invertebrates, let's ponder on this environment. In this place, part of the day you're covered in water and part of the day you're exposed to the air. What are the ramifications of constant wave action as seen here? When the tide is out, what we call low tide, how does this influence temperature, desiccation, salinity, a study on the California mussel using a thermal probe within its shells recorded an internal temperature of 27.5 degrees Celsius in midday on a low tide, and as soon as the tide covered the mussel, it dropped to 15 degrees Celsius, showing an incredible ability to tolerate extreme temperature changes. In addition to physiological tolerance to abiotic factors, other influences that determine which intertidal zone a species lives in include food availability, tides, waves, mobility, competition, and predation. Imagine having to adapt to being submerged and then dry, prone to both aquatic and terrestrial predators, dealing with fluctuations from hot to cold, from salt water to rainwater. Seaweed thrive in this habitat. These bull kelp beds that you see here can grow over 30 meters in height. These kelp forests serve as shelter and habitat for fish, crabs, sea stars, and many other species. Seaweeds are fascinating. Are they plants? Protists? Algae? This depends on the seaweed. Basic seaweed anatomy includes the leafy looking blades, a float, a stipe or stalk, and a holdfast. Seaweeds need three things to survive, sunlight for photosynthesis, nutrients for growth, and a substrate to hold on to, which is where the holdfast comes in. This sea lettuce is very thin and can be consumed by humans. Because it grows in the low to mid intertidal zones, low tides can expose sea lettuce to the air, meaning they need to be adapted for desiccation or drying out. Importantly, these macroalgae, or multicellular marine algae, produce about 20% of our atmospheric oxygen. In addition to being more efficient than plants at photosynthesis, algae sequesters a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is cytosiphon, a type of brown algae commonly known as sausage links due to its hollow, sausage-like chains. What other seaweed can we find at Navy Channel? Here we have five rib kelp. Notice the wrinkled blade. This kelp is preyed on by sea urchins. This is Turkish towel, covered in small bumps. The blades of Turkish towel grow thicker in more wave-exposed areas. This one is sargassum, or Japanese wireweed. As the name suggests, this is an invasive species though there's some debate on if they help more than they harm our local ecosystems. Note the small float bladders, which enable the blades or fronds to be held close to the water surface. 
Rockweed is very common in our area. Kids like to pop their swollen air bladders. However, these actually contain the reproductive structures of rockweed. Finally, this is sugar kelp, generally restricted to more wave-sheltered areas. Its name originates from a pale-colored sweet powder that forms on its dry frond. Even when seaweed is dead, such as this washed up rockweed, it can serve as a moist shelter for organisms in the high intertidal zone. These are beach hoppers or sand fleas, small amphipods with laterally flattened bodies, meaning flattened from side to side. To avoid desiccating, they move up and down the shore to find wet sand. You'll find many opportunistic predators in the intertidal zone. Here are some cool kelp encrusting bryozoans. Bryozoans mean moss animal. They have a hard exoskeleton of calcium carbonate, which gives protection and keeps them attached to the kelp. These colonial and sessile, or non moving, aquatic invertebrates will die when their host kelp dies. Like barnacles, they are filter feeders. Also, like barnacles, they have a motile larval stage before they attach to their permanent home and undergo metamorphosis. Okay, let's head out into the rocky intertidal. Keeping in mind that we are visitors in this place and should always step with care and attention. Here we are at Oyster Bay. We can see vertical zonation, that is, the pattern or layering of species and communities in relation to shore height. Keep an eye out for distinct bands of specific organisms. These blue mussels are bivalves, meaning two shell halves. Produced within the shell are bisal threads, which are iron-rich, sticky proteins that help anchor them to rocks and to each other. On first glance, a mussel bed might appear to be a monoculture. However, mussels are actually ecosystem engineers. By growing in dense beds, they increase habitat diversity, allowing for smaller species to thrive by providing substrate and beneficial environmental conditions. In this way, they help maintain species richness. Mussels that are exposed to higher wave action, such as these, will grow smaller in size. Mussels don't grow too far down into the low intertidal zone since sea stars prey on them. Compared to mussels, sea stars are not as well adapted to avoid drying out. The upper limits of mussel distribution is determined by higher elevations where they are prone to desiccation. To recap, the mussels' lower limits of distribution are set by sea star predation and upper limits set by drying out. Desiccation stress is more significant in the higher tertidal zone, where some seaweeds lose 90% of their water content. In addition, organisms in the higher tertidal zone need a greater tolerance for shifts in salinity or salt concentration. This type of zonation is found all along rocky coastlines from California to Alaska. As you see here, there is a distinct place where the mussels begin. Here's another look at vertical zonation. You can see the barnacles stretching above the rockweed. Let's take a closer look. The rockweed prefers to live at a lower elevation compared to the barnacles that go higher up the rock. Where the barnacles end, we can surmise the water never or rarely reaches, since barnacles need to be submerged in water in order to filter feed. Speaking of barnacles, I believe these gritty arthropods are the most dangerous animal of the intertidal zone, as the scrapes on my arms and legs can attest. At the end of their larval stage, they glue themselves head first to a secure surface, such as this rock. At Campbell Bay, we can see a similar distinct band of mussels. Let's have a look at this boulder which shows zonation rather nicely. Zooming in for a closer look, we see some sea lettuce, which is only two cells thick. 
Then higher up we have rockweed with their swollen air bladders that contain their reproductive structures. Even higher on the rock are barnacles only, and then bare rock. Limpets are aquatic snails. Their cone-shaped shells protect them from both desiccation and from predators. Limpets use their radula to scrape off algae, growing new teeth every one to two days. These teeth are, in fact, the strongest biological material known to humankind, stronger than steel and spider silk. Some coast sailors peoples pried off limpets with a stick to eat them, often raw. This shows the most recent high tide line whose waves brought in this seaweed drift. A low tide in Pigot Bay often reveals Maine Island's greatest intertidal wonders. Here's a dense bit of rockweed. You'll note here the distinct height where rockweed starts to grow. Here you can witness some clams squirting water out of their siphons, which is a long tube-like structure. Think of a siphon like a snorkel, functioning to circulate water into and out of the clam for respiration, feeding, and waste removal. Bivalve mollusks that you find here include butter clam, horse clam, and manila or little neck clam. Can you figure out who is eating who here? If we head back underwater, we'll discover a sea cucumber. These are echinoderms, meaning they're cousins of the sea stars. This sea cucumber has extruded its tentacles near its mouth, which it uses for suspension feeding, collecting food particles floating in the water. All right, I hope you enjoyed this quick introduction to the rocky intertidal ecosystems of Maine Island. I encourage you to check out the tide tables and visit a beach during low tide. You never know what you might find lurking under the water.